What's going on all my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. My goal is to help you pass your NCLEX as well as those nursing school exams like a boss. And today we're gonna to be discussing hypophosphatemia. Let's get our electrolyte on. So in order to understand electrolyte imbalances, we really have to understand what the electrolyte is. What is phosphorus? Well, a normal range for phosphorus is between three to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter. And some of the main functions of phosphorus is it's really regulated by the parathyroid and calcitrol hormones. It helps regulate calcium, right? So it has an inverse relationship with calcium. So when phosphorus is down, calcium is going to go up and vice versa. They have a very inverse relationship. It also helps with cellular metabolism, metabolism as well as energy production through ATP. What does ATP stand for? Adenosine triphosphate. It's in the name, right? So we need to have phosphorus in order to help with cellular metabolism and energy production. Phospholipid bilayers in our cell membrane. Again, phospholipid, phosphorus. We need to have phosphorus in order to maintain those cell membranes. And lastly, it's essential for bone and teeth formation. It helps maintain the strength in our bones and our teeth. So phosphate plays a major role in our bodies and we really need to maintain it in order to maintain those body functions. So what is hypophosphatemia? Hypo means low, phosphatemia means phosphorus in the blood. So we're going to have a low phosphorus in the blood. So you're going to see lab values less than 3.0 milligrams per deciliter. And some of the different cause categories, the first being insufficient phosphorus intake. So when we have patients that are malnutritioned or starved, we ultimately start to see um, these shifts in electrolytes in our blood. Specifically with starvation, we start providing TPN to our patients who have been significantly starved of nutrition for a long period of time, we start to develop something that's called refeeding syndrome. And really refeeding syndrome is potentially fatal because of the shifts of fluids and electrolytes that occur in our malnourished patients receiving TPN. So it's extremely important that we continuously monitor all of their electrolytes. So that way we don't make those shifts worse than what they are during refeeding syndrome. Another category is increased phosphorus excretion. So with hyperparathyroidism, calcium levels will go up, phosphorus levels will go down. They have a very inverse relationship. You'll also see hypophosphatemia when it comes to malignancy, the use of magnesium-based or aluminum hydroxide-based antacids also cause an increase in calcium, which depletes our phosphorus levels. And lastly, diuretics and diarrhea can also cause low phosphate levels. And our last category for hypophosphatemia is intracellular shifting. So with hyperglycemia, alcohol withdrawal severely wastes phosphate in our body. So when we start to have our CWA patients that are coming off of all of that alcohol and they start withdrawing, you're going to see that decrease in phosphate in the body. Thermal burns is another one, as well as hepatic encephalopathy, because hepatic encephalopathy increases ammonia in the body, ultimately decreasing phosphate. And lastly, you'll see hypophosphatemia with a lot of our respiratory alkalosis patients. So what is our patient population that are experiencing hypophosphatemia really going to look like? So as we know, phosphorus really helps with cellular metabolism, right? So it's gonna help with energy, as well as it is going to help with the integrity of our phospholipid bilayers. So if we don't have enough, the systems are gonna to start to become depleted of energy and the cells are going to start to become damaged. So when it comes to our cardiovascular system, we're gonna have a decrease in contractility as well as cardiac output and slowed peripheral pulses. With our respiratory system, we're gonna have very shallow respirations. We don't have enough energy to help maintain those respirations. With our neuromuscular system, we're gonna have weakness, decreased deep tendon reflexes, decreased bone density that can cause fractures as well as alterations in bone shape. Um, and we can even experience rhabdomyolysis due to the breakdown of cell membranes in our muscles. So with rhabdo, you get that really dark, disgusting urine, 
you're going to see that because we don't have the phosphorus in order to maintain that phospholipid bilayer that we need for the cell membranes in our muscles. When it comes to our central nervous system, we're going to have irritability, confusion, seizures, and it can ultimately lead to coma if we don't correct it. Renal system, you're going to see kidney stones due to that increase in calcium, right? So if our phosphorus is low, our calcium is high, if our calcium is high, you're going to see those kidney stones start to occur if it's severe enough. Um, you're going to see decreased platelet aggregation as well as increased bleeding, right? Because those are a couple things that calcium also helps with. Um, phosphorus, if it's low, you're going to start to see a lot of those hypercalcemia um, symptoms with that low phosphorus as well as immunosuppression. We don't have the energy or the means to maintain a appropriate immune system, so our immune system is going to become suppressed. And lastly, when it comes to our laboratory findings, you're going to see a serum phosphorus level that is less than three milligrams per deciliter. So what are we gonna do? How are we going to intervene to help these patients? Well, our main goal number one is to replace the phosphorus that we lost, either by IV or PO. So when we're administering phosphorus orally, we want to administer along with vitamin D supplementations to help with the absorption of phosphorus. If we're administering phosphorus IV, when serum levels begin to fall below one milligram per deciliter and when the patient is experiencing critical manifestations, we really want to make sure that we're giving it to these patients very slowly, just like with any electrolyte, because we want to prevent the risk of developing hyperphosphatemia. We don't want to send them in the opposite direction. So if it is severe enough, like we said, it's below one milligram per deciliter and the patient is experiencing critical manifestations, then we really start to give phosphorus IV to hopefully correct it, but we don't want to correct it too much and send them in the opposite direction. We want to monitor our renal system prior to administering our phosphorus. We want to move the patient carefully because again, Fractures can occur with these patients with these low phosphorus levels. And we want to discontinue medications that cause phosphorus loss. So our osmotic diuretics and acids, calcium supplements, as well as phosphate binders like our calcium acetate and aluminum hydroxide should be discontinued with our hypophosphatemia patients. So as with all of our electrolyte patients, we really want to provide education. And one of the ways that we can do that is particularly talking about their diet. So when it comes to hypophosphatemia, we really want to increase that intake of phosphorus rich foods. But in the same coin, we also need to decrease their intake of calcium rich foods because they have a very inverse relationship. If you're increasing phosphorus rich foods, but still eating a lot of calcium rich foods, it's really not going to make a difference. So you really have to find that balance. So phosphorus rich foods, the first thing that you're going to see is dairy products. Dairy products is high in calcium. So depending on how severe that hypophosphatemia is, dairy products might not be an option for these patients. Additional phosphorus rich foods can include fish, nuts, pumpkins, different kind of organ meats, pork, beef, and chicken, as well as squash. And when it comes to our calcium rich foods, we want to decrease those. So we may have to decrease those dairy products that we talked about before, those cheese, milks, and yogurts. We also want to decrease collard greens as well as broccoli, tofu, and sardines. I hope that this video was helpful for you in passing your nursing exams like a boss. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Make sure that you follow me on my social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as here on YouTube. Make sure that you subscribe as well as like this video. I also have a website at www.nursechung.com where I will have NCLEX style questions as well as additional resources with each of my videos. So make sure that you check that out. But until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I will speak with you all again soon. Bye.